guys have Minnesota sports flowing in their veins. Mackie and Judd on Score North and scorenorth.com. It's a scoop session Thursday. Maybe even a reckless speculation Thursday. Reckless speculation. To all who celebrate with our guy, Darren Doogie Wolfson from the 5 Eyewitness News Sports Department. Darren, how are you today? How are you feeling? I am well, Phil. Happy Halloween. More importantly, happy Reckless Speculation Thursday. The countdown is on. Forget the election. Enough people can spew enough BS about that leading into next Tuesday. But think about it. Days away from the start of arbitration, I am on my way after this conversation to connect with somebody in town who is an expert in this area. Just for some background, I feel like I have some working knowledge, a baseline of knowledge when it comes to what will take place starting Monday, Glenn Taylor against Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez. But I'm seeking more knowledge just on how the process exactly will play out. Then, hey, Tuesday, NFL trade deadline, will the Vikings do maybe even a little bit more? That's my question. So do, do we think now we, we know that, that they have certainly been inquiring about defensive tackles, cornerbacks. A week ago at this time, left tackle, ah, that's no problem. You got Christian Derrishaw. Darius Saw, Kirk Herbstreet's favorite player. Love me some uh, he, he goes down. The Vikings actually, and I was very pleasantly surprised. I think I predicted with you on Tuesday that I did not think that that they would replace Darius Saw externally, but but they make the trade for Cam Robinson, a starting caliber left tackle from Jacksonville, a very reasonable like draft pick swap. The price was not high. Uh, he, he is a rental, but that's absolutely fine. But so here's where my curiosity is peak guys that to me sort of leans towards they're not done making moves because if you go out and get a starting caliber left tackle, you are saying, and I love this. Hey, this locker room deserves that, right? Five wins, five and two now, but five wins. And I would actually be more inclined Darren to say right now that I think the Vikings are going to be, or at least try to be as active as possible by next Tuesday's deadline based on the Robinson acquisition and the message that sends about the plans here. I agree. Now, if they somehow lose on Sunday, pretty heavy favor, but if they lose Sunday, it could skew things ever so slightly. But yes, Judd, based on the amount of chatter externally that's been going on, going back weeks, you mentioned the two positions to keep an eye on. I've been mentioning that for weeks, cornerback and interior defensive line. Yep. I don't know how you don't do a little bit more. Now, hey, we brought up Cam Robinson's name on Tuesday for a reason, but like you, I didn't think it would happen. But based on the price, I've seen some blowback on social media. I don't think they gave up all that much when you consider no. the strong likelihood that there will be some compensatory, you know, back their way in, what, 2026, you know, some sort of compensatory pick back in 2026 when, when Robinson departs as a free agent next March with Jacksonville eating a good chunk of the contract. Now, hey, if he plays now, what, an injury setback last year, suspension last year, concussion protocol earlier this year, like he needs to stay in the field. But if he stays in the field, it's going to be a 2026 fourth. And based on that, the Vikings are not going to get a seventh in 2026, but they will receive some sort of compensatory pick in all likelihood, I really like the trade. But yeah, I didn't necessarily see it happening. But at this point, I guess I'll be surprised if they don't do anything else. They view, Phil and Jet, I'm just telling you, they view it still as the NFC being pretty darn wide open. I think we can make a case that, okay, Detroit, clear cut, best team. But like, you can still make a strong case. The Vikings are the number two team in the NFC. Now I get it. If you want to argue the commanders, the Eagles, Perhaps the Packers, maybe the 49ers with Christian McCaffrey on his way back here pretty darn soon. That's fine. But I'm just telling you, the way they view it internally, they can still make a run in January. Yeah, this I feel like this is a big game to just get back on track and just in the standings. And if you start to let it spiral now, a third straight loss, and you've got three road games coming up that you should be favored in, this is a big game from that standpoint. Um, what... Is Cam Robinson starting on Sunday, do we think? Because he wasn't at practice yesterday, right? He was still flying right. in. Yep. And he is coming off that concussion. He's cleared. But it's new team, new system. 
kind of coming in hot here at the end of the week into practice. Now, Questenberry was limited with a knee on the practice report yesterday. So what do we think the offensive line looks like here? So okay. I, did, I, I – Yeah, go ahead, Judd. So I, I asked O'Connell um, in his press conference yesterday, what's the ramp up? Like if you bring in – and I, I mean, you know – Dobbs came in and unexpectedly had to play in, in the Falcons game days after being acquired. Now, in that case, it was necessitated by Hall going out. But my question was like, what does it take for a left tackle to get in- integrated into the offense? And he basically said, well, there's some there's some uh, verbiage things. There are some run protection things. But I will, I think if O'Connell has his way, and he does not always get his way, I don't think, because I think if he did, TJ Hawkinson would have been playing long ago. Uh, I think if O'Connell gets his way, Cam Robinson will start. Unless the physical does not go well, Doogie, or something like that. But listening to Kevin talk about like what it takes, I came away with the impression that Kevin O'Connell wants to, cam robinson to start at left tackle on sunday and that the actual integration is not that difficult that you that that you would say there's no way yeah and i mean there are different ways you can offer some help when needed yes my understanding is when they completed that trade on tuesday official on wednesday that the idea is cam robinson is playing on sunday now i get it like let's see how he looks today at practice, how much of a whirlwind is it? But he is ready to go. You talk to people down in Jacksonville. I don't think he handled the situation last Sunday particularly well. Like cleared, but then doesn't play, told he's not starting, didn't handle that real well. And so he is absolutely itching to get back in there. I think he'd like to get some action before the game back there in Jacksonville. The following Sunday. So, yes, I will be surprised Mm. if we don't see Cam Robinson out there a good amount. Now, you know, if you give him the full allotment, I guess you could see how it goes. But, yeah, bottom line, like when they made the deal, the idea is, okay, he is out there on Sunday. Yeah. Uh, Hey, I I have a Jordan Addison thing because this free three has been sort of twisted all over the place and. He had the necklace on draft day. It's like his brand has is, is been free three since college. But his if there was any doubt over what he meant when he put a picture of himself and free three on Instagram, I believe it was his dad that retweeted a statistic on, uh, was it Tuesday or Wednesday this week, that Jordan Addison has created the second widest uh, separation gap between him and cornerbacks in the NFL based on whatever data point. And his dad retweeted it with hashtag free three. So, I mean, I don't want to be conspiracy guy, but it's pretty obvious that the Addison family is not thrilled with the amount of targets and catches that he has. If I were him and them, after some of the off the field stuff the last two years, Doogie, I might just put a lid on it for the season and just zip it up. Yeah, Um, I don't know if if Jordan's dad is, is capable. That's why he's an interesting follow on Twitter. Yeah, I mean, he's pretty aggressive. On there. I mean, I guess, hey, after Kirk Cousins exited and dad Kirk Cousins exited the situation, we needed some sort of dad presence on social media. But yeah, I agree, Phil. (laughs) Like, after everything you've gone through off the field with the organization sticking by you, yeah, like let it play out just a little bit more. I get it if there's some unhappiness in terms of targets. Now, in the locker room on Monday, I asked him that direct question. I said, Are you okay with the amount of targets? you're getting and he chose his words properly said i'm fine i'm good right now is he right i mean i don't think dad is is putting it out there just randomly right there's there's enough dialogue with his son but yes at this point just be quiet because i'm telling you the opportunities especially with hawkinson back there's going to be enough one-on-one opportunities jordan's targets will be plenty fine i would wager on the rest of the season but that's the thing too is like th- this is not like uh they're picking and choosing or or that that they're not cho- choosing him on purpose. Now I will say it is odd that Johnny Munt has 14 receptions and he does, okay? I I know that it's Munt in two more games, but still that does strike me as odd, but we are we are you know the old there's only one football to go around. You know, uh 
Phil and I talked about this early in the week, Dukes, but when you look at it, this team was near the bottom of the league in rushing attempts last year. They are now near, they are now closer to the top of the entire league. Which was so, the plan, right? When you and, signed Aaron Jones, we could have exactly. all foreseen and that. Aaron, we said it, right? That they're going to run the ball a good amount more this year. And Aaron Jones is getting a ton of touches and he probably deserves that. Justin Jefferson can't be ignored or we'll talk about that. You just said it. TJ Hawkinson is coming back. He provides an outlet. So I don't think that this is like an anti-Jordan Addison discussion or problem. I think this is literally, you've got to understand that for the offense to be as successful as possible, the inflated statistics of everybody, I mean, Jefferson's different and Jones is a running back, but it's not like O'Connell's picking and choosing here. You are you are Jefferson, Jones, options. And by the way, we all said to Kevin, you got to run more, dude. And now he he is. So I don't know that there is an easy answer here to, well, this is how we're going to get uh, Jordan Addison in particular more targets. Agree. I mean, do you think Jefferson is real pleased with the amount of targets he had in the second half last Thursday? I don't remember right. the exact number, but. He was targeted yeah. early, had a presence early, not so much latter part of that game. So we can play that game with him as well. I think it'll even itself out over the course of 17 games enough with Addison also fully having to realize where he is pecking order-wise. You said it. At best, he's the number three option that Jones is going to get 16 to 22 touches per game. How many offensive plays are you running? 55 to 60 ish, that's, somewhere in that range. Yeah, okay. That's the problem. Well, so how many yep. are left? It just, it's right. not going to work where you're going to get 10, 11, 12 targets. And O'Connell sa said that uh, on Wednesday. And I think that this is a point of uh, contention for him that he's frustrated about. And it's simple O'Connell does not feel, I think, that they've had a game yet where there have been enough offensive plays. I think it was 50 something against the Rams, and he hates that. But I mean, he wants to he wants to significantly jack that up, uh, and he has brought that up in probably four separate press conferences scattered throughout the season about the play. So yeah, his what he would point to is exactly that: we are not running enough offensive plays for me to get the distribution of the football wow. that I want. Real quick, I didn't. That's that's an amazing stat. I just looked that up. So not only have the Vikings run the fewest offensive plays of any team in the NFL. Okay, then, it is so, the fewest. I knew they were up there, but it is literally the fewest amount of plays. Three hundred ninety-seven oh, plays. Okay. The ch the Chargers who run a very slow oh, pace run game, heavy. Right? So some of those stats are skewed a little bit, right? With the bye. Yep. So there's there's like ten teams that have played seven games, and the rest have played eight. So that's point taken. Uh, but of the teams that have played only seven games, the the the, the next lowest play count is twenty three more plays this season. It's the Chargers. So yeah, they are for whatever reason they are just not running. It's it's not moving the chains enough. It's some of their like they also have some big strike like when Darnold completes a pass, there's a one in three chance it's a forty yard <laughs> bomb down the field which chunks you down. But they do not have like the ten, twelve long sustaining drive that some of these other teams do. That's a great stat. All right, and where are they at in terms of the defense? Because the defense has been on the field a ton. So do you have that handy, Phil, to yeah, look up yeah. how often the Vikings defense has been on the field? I feel it's like a stats it has machine, to be man. He's got there. every stat. I got it. So the Vikings yeah. defense has actually seen the 11th fewest plays. Mm, so okay. what we're learning right, here is Vikings, Vikings games. Now, <laughs> well, okay, to your point, the seven games versus the eight games, uh, the, Vikings have, the Vikings defense has seen, of the teams that have only played seven games, the most plays. Okay, there we go. All right. So – Yes, they are. The defense is on the field a lot. That's another reason why maybe the defense has sputtered a bit against the last two opponents. So how do you, I guess the only way to flip it is the offense needs to get out there and move the chains more frequently. Nine, 10, 11 play drives, wow. right? Yeah. Well, absolutely. And also on the defense, though, I mean, just talking to a number of guys this week, there was so much love for Ben Johnson for Sean McVay, the personnel on the Lions, the personnel on the Rams, that you look at that two-game sample size with Cup back, with Nakua back, mm -hmm. you're not necessarily seeing 
that, at least for a few weeks, depending on how Caleb Williams continues to develop. Maybe you see it on November 24th, but you're really not seeing that over the next three games. Now, hey, they also missed Blake Cashman, and hey, we await word. I told you on Tuesday I didn't have a good feel, and those close to Blake were leading me to believe leading into the Rams game there was optimism heading into the Colts game, but that optimism wasn't there on Tuesday. At this point, like, questionable to doubtful. Like, I wish I could tell you right now, like, definitively, okay, Blake is going to be out there on Sunday. Yeah. I'm just yeah. not at that point, but clearly they missed him in those last two games. He didn't practice. Uh, and and O'Connell before the, I think it was the Friday after the Rams game, sounded very optimistic. It's like we fully expect him to play against the Colts, and he has pulled that way back. So, no, I don't yes. know if there's – but, but you know, keep in mind, too, turf toe – Turf toe sounds well. It's turf toe. It's like a sprain of the ligament. It's a it's a major problem, it, because you don't want to bring a guy back, aggravate it, because he'll be out again for a month. Um, Phil, on the plays offensively, I think one and it's a small thing, but it adds up. I think one contributing factor, certainly of late, has been all of these procedural and delay of games. Yeah, because that puts you now in in first and fifteen, and then you're in second and let's say twelve. And now you're all, you, now the sustainability of the drive is almost gone. Yeah. So so like I think that there are definite factors that can be cleaned up that are causing three and outs, uh, because you are putting yourself so far behind the sticks. The Vikings are easily the most Excellent. penalized team in the NFL of the teams that have only played seven games. Yeah. All right, and pre-snap as well. Do they break it down like pre-snap yeah. penalty specifically in offense? Are they number one? They've committed the second most pre-snap penalties of any team in the league. Let's give a round of applause to Phil Mackey, who has come up Thank with you, every everyone. possible yes. stat. Thank we you. Could, we could <laughs> dream of. Yes. Tony Rialli, eat your heart out. Yeah, you know what, Declan? <laughs> Declan, stop I need trying to look things up. Phil's going to look things up from now on. Hembo, mm -hmm. so, we love yeah. you a greenie, but hey, Phil Mackey's You're the man when it comes to stats. Right. You're out. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, just stop, stop with the pre-snap penalties. And maybe it leads to more sustained drives and you give your defense a breather because that defense too, I don't know if there's a stat for this, but in terms of like activity on defense and just the amount of ground you're covering, you're showing seven, eight at the line of scrimmage, you're sprinting back into a cover two. Um, I would bet that the Vikings are asking their players to run a lot more just to cover ground in short bursts, the way that they start every snap. And to be out there that long, I, I feel like we just fixed the Vikings, quite frankly. I don't know if, if they want to just have us in to speak to the team, maybe on Friday or Saturday, but yeah. Well, somebody we all know very well, Josh Metellus, you could have a very nice conversation with him about the conditioning, knowing what sort of condition he needs to be. And that's why he does this long distance running June and July. When I say long distance, it's not like he's running 20 something miles, but He's running multiple miles, the yoga, the Pilates, other guys, Blake Cashman's big on, on that. They know they need to be in tip-top shape based yeah. on everything that Flores is asking them to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got more with Doogie here in a moment, but let me take you guys to Park Dental, my new dentist. I was, uh, I was lost. My head was spinning. My old dentist retired. And I was out in the wilderness. Who's gonna? Am I ever gonna have my teeth cleaned again, or am I just gonna be? Am I gonna have to get dentures? Well, Park Dental came in and said, "Why don't you? Why don't you stop by for a for a cleaning, a checkup?" I had a great experience for over 50 years. Park Dental has been caring for and cleaning teeth in Minnesota and Western Wisconsin, and uh, they offer a bunch of different locations throughout the metro area. So if you're like me, you were looking for a new dentist. I now have a dental home, parkdental.com to schedule your checkup, parkdental.com. Uh, it wasn't he... really a pat on the shoulder or back, yeah. Phil, like you were separating your shoulder, patting yourself on the back. It was more like you were tapping. Did you have like a name sticker there? I had a name sticker. I think I was like walking out. I just, I love it. I think I was given the, uh, like the thank you sort of chest bump okay. to, you know, right. like when you do the heart kind of, yeah. Hey, thank you for cleaning my teeth. The lady back at the front desk, oh, yeah. yeah. attention. She was feigning interest, even with the camera. That was also the fourth take, really probably. That we... <laughs> I love it. Oh man. So, yeah, how are you? Uh, how are you going to be preparing pregame, leading up to the big arbitration hearing next week? Are you 
Are you having friends over? Can we stream it on pay-per-view? How does this work with the Timberwolves? How great would that be? I mean, it's going to be a process, although how entertaining would it be to be in that room? Oh, my God, that would be entertaining. Both Dude, sides. If, if they put it on pay-per-view, I would be in. I would pay for that to watch it on pay-per-view. Well, sure. I mean, it would be a company expense anyway, right? Show prep. But, yes, it doesn't matter. We would absolutely pay. Just name the price. But, yeah, both sides, Phil, remain relatively optimistic optimistic cautiously optimistic maybe more so the lori and a rod side i've been beating this drum for the longest time but the point i'll make is i don't know if i've made it in this space lori in particular i'm sure alex has as well but working hard to get those votes those 23 votes necessary so thinking okay we absolutely can win the arbitration case but we then need 23 affirmative votes from the board of governors and can they secure those 23 votes? And I still believe that to me is what it comes down to. I get it. Mark and Alex have a great case. They do. I'm not suggesting like I know for sure they're going to win, but I'm just saying it is a great case. Can they get those 23 votes? Are the other owners willing to say, okay, Mark, okay, Alex, take over. The wolves are being sold for $1.5 billion, where if you put the Wolves back on the market today, we're talking close to $3 billion. Maybe not quite the Phoenix Suns sale price, but somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah. two six, two seven, certainly way higher than one five. Will they not get the votes based on that? So, like, for, forget the allegiance potentially to Glenn or something like that, but Glenn sold them for so low, especially now, I'm just curious if the owners would quash based on that because I don't think it sets a very good precedent to to have have this scale going up, 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 and then it gets to the walls and it goes dip, and then it goes back up. So what are the chances that they they would have problem gaining approval just based on the sale price, Dukes? Yeah, I mean, I'm completely opining, not like I know for sure. What I do know for sure... It's reckless speculation Thursday. You have full cover. No one will call and complain. Yeah, I don't think. no, no, I, I understand it. But yes, that to me is it, Judd. Like, I just right. don't get if you're like James Dolan, right? Or Jerry Reinsdorf. Right. I don't know how you approve the sale at $1.5 billion. Now, hey, Bobby Marks, other really smart people I'm in touch with say, hey, for the longest time, Adam Silver, others with the NBA have gone on the record saying it's a legal matter that they're not dipping their toes into this situation. So, like, okay, the judgment is Mark and Alex. Let's just push this thing out to early December. Mark and Alex win arbitration. Mm -hmm. Should then the league say, okay, for the longest time they're saying it's a legal matter, we're not getting involved. Shouldn't they then support what that legal decision is? So I understand that. But – It's not that cut and dry. It's just not. There's enough nuance, enough gray area, particularly with these owners. And I just don't know deep down if they're willing to approve the sale at 1.5. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be, man, be a fascinating. And then there's the timeline of because you're getting into the holidays. Um, This thing is going to linger into I've And I've been told all along, just back to like the summer, the first week in November does not decide like this is going to linger deep into oh, the 2024 yeah. 25 season. So if you're if you're <laughs> not sick of it yet, folks, strap well, in lawsuits, the possibility at least of lawsuits. It's I mean, great. <laughs> yes, we're not going to get like definitive closure anytime real soon, unless yeah. again, reckless speculation here on a Thursday that Michael Bloomberg comes in and says, Okay, I've already established somewhat of a relationship. Let me cut that 2.6 or 2.7 or whatever that number is. Well billion beyond one dollars. Buy the twins check. and the wolves. <laughs> I've not Builds heard of Bloomberg a... Twins interest. But sure, just cut it's the check. Speculation Thursday. I know. Oh, it would be fantastic. I do think it's probably realistic at this point that, you know, if the poll ads eventually sell, speaking of a long process, I think this is going to be a long process. The poll ad settling one? right now for 1.5. Or one six when the Orioles sold earlier this calendar year for one seven one or one seven two. Maybe ultimately they, you know, settle on one six five or one seven. But right in this moment, 
I don't think they're looking for anything less than mm. what the Orioles sold for, but uh, that the future Twins owner, like, that's an outsider. That's not, you know, I don't think it's the Davis family. I don't think it's the Cargill family. I don't know who else it would be locally. I've not heard of Glenn Taylor interest or Stanley Hubbard interest, anything like that. So, yeah, I mean, I think at this point, whether it's a Bloomberg or somebody else, it's an outsider. It's not somebody here in the state of Minnesota. Right. What about the Otani family? Maybe the <laughs> Otani family could. The Soto could family. The I'm telling you, that's the my Soto platform. Family. Juan, come and play for us. You can have the team. The Trout family? The Trout family could. Oh, no, he's not going to move. He's could. happy. <laughs> he's or yeah, only he's gorgeous. Know, does the Kirillov family have some deep pockets? Is that yeah. why Alex Kirillov announced oh. his retirement today? Yeah. Yeah. You can't be a player slash owner. Is there a Kirilov plan? They'll I'm fire about. everyone if he gets that job. I'll tell you that right now. Well, no one's safe. I would agree on that. Yeah, so, I mean, injuries suck, right? The wrist, the shoulder, most recently the back. So Alex Kirilov retiring before he turns 27. But sure, some of the frustration, some of the swing change recommendations, not mandates, but some recommendations made to Alex. Could Alex swing the bat like he truly wanted to? Just a lot of moving parts. All the things he did to treat those injuries. Think about the shots, stuff like that. It starts to take its toll, starts to add up. So, yeah, Alex Kirilov at 26 years old announcing his retirement. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, man, just unfortunate with all the injuries. And it kind of there's been other twins. Jason Kubel was a little bit of a what if, but he actually had some big time major league seasons, but with the knee injuries. But he, he'll he go in that category of, man, what if he had stayed healthy? Byron Buxton. Um, Dudes, what else is left in your scoop bag here on this this Halloween reckless speculation Thursday? Well, first off, on Kirilov, is there a punishment? So it was like three ish years ago, it was a write that down. That yeah, one oh, day Alex it. Kirilov would win an American League batting title or a batting title. I don't even know if I declared it American League thinking there was a chance maybe he gets traded somewhere along the way. But is there a punishment? Because I did not win that Write that down. Well, no, hold, wait, wait. It's not done. He has to prove he's going to stay retired. Well, no, it, it's once he retires, it's done. And then it doesn't well, stay on the board. The to leave. Right. What if he, I get where the, you're going, Judd. Yeah. 2032. It's the greatest yeah. one of great comeback stories. And you're going to take it off the board now? Yeah, Doogie, this is one of the <laughs> older predictions on the board here. I think it's from five years ago. Maybe it was, you predict- it was a long time ago. Yeah. It might have been pre-COVID. I, yeah. I remember when you said it. You said Alex Kirloff will win a batting title before his career ends. He is oh. ending his career with this retirement. If he re- if he brings his career back, just, Doogie can make another prediction. Arbitra- then it but goes to arbitration. His- it's going to go to arbitration. <laughs> starts Tuesday. Doogie V. Mackey. No. Lawyer Chase. Retired I think Judge Frazier, my guy. <laughs> your, be yeah. my guy. Yeah, who's your deciding lo- vote? Who's your guy, Rod Phil? Lori against Taylor. He can be the deciding vote for us as well. He's got some free Judge time. Judy is my my gal for this one. I'll, I'll find. No, <laughs> Lawyer Chase. Lawyer Chase. Uh, Dukes, anything else before we part ways? And yeah, so Frank see you Mitchell, go for starting center. They're playing Hamlin the other night, dives for a ball when they're up 16 to nothing. Now, if you're playing Ugh. Purdue, heck of an effort. Applaud the effort. Exhibition game up 16. You don't necessarily need to dive, make a business decision, but hey, Frank goes all out, messes up his shoulder. They're still awaiting one more test, one more piece of information. But there is decent optimism Mm. that this is not a multi-month setback. But like thinking about six days from now, the Gophers play Oral Roberts in their season opener. Do not expect Frank Mitchell to be out there for that game. So it's just it's another setback. You know, four years in, Ben Johnson, it's been one injury after another. Isaiah Enan, Parker Fox, Dawson Garcia, although Dawson fine now. But it's just it's been one after another. Now Tyler Cochran. And Frank Mitchell, two transfers he's brought in that were going to have a big role next Wednesday, and now neither will. Yeah. He is Darren Doogie Wolfson from the five Eyewitness News Sports Department. And one more, probably no surprise, for Chad Greenway's daughter, Madden, who's a phenomenal soccer player, by the way. Like, if she just wanted to pursue soccer, I have no doubt she could play professionally. That's how good she is. But also an excellent basketball player. She released her final six the headline is no gophers. Now, I probably could have told you that mm. a year ago that it Hawkeyes wasn't don't. trending in that direction, but now officially 
Madden Greenway will be leaving home. Providence Academy, Iowa is among Uh the final six. Stanford as well. No UConn, no South Carolina. I thought maybe a couple years ago there was a chance that Gino or Don might get involved, but neither, at least from what I can tell, ever got heavily involved. But nonetheless, Madden Greenway, an unbelievably good guard, and she will play high major college basketball, and it's not going to be in a Gophers uniform. Good stuff, Dukes. Good stuff here. We'll do it again Tuesday, sir. Okay. Sounds good, boys. Enjoy Halloween. Right. Darren yeah. Doogie Wolfson, yeah, Minnesota right. Sports with Mackie and Judd.